welcome to the Daria virtual exchange event. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jennifer Edmund. I'm the president of the board of directors of the Daria Eric. I'm also an uh, associate professor of digital humanities at Trinity College Dublin. And <clears throat> you will notice that there's a number of things that we're trying to do in this event and in this, this entire experiment in, in virtual scholarly exchange that are a little bit different. So the first thing I want to do is kind of give you a sense of how we would love to have you connect over the course of the next two hours. Um, first of all, if you have notifications on, if you have anything that's going to really aggressively pull you out of the space that we've created, um, I would suggest you might want to mute those. Um, there is this idea of continuous partial attention. Um, you can look it up. Uh, Linda Stone is the person who came up with this term. And I think it's really important to remember that there are, there are really productive ways to get distracted, to open ourselves up to serendipity, to follow the interesting lead. And there are ways to actually scatter our attention in ways where the, the, the sum is less um, than, than all of the parts together. But also, while you're not being distracted by things outside of this event, we'd like to actually encourage you to be distracted by things inside of this event and to make connections. Um, and those are connections between people and connections between ideas. We've already given you some prompts for making connections between ideas in the uh, exhibition space. If you want to be looking at that alongside while I'm talking, I welcome that. It's a different kind of event. But also, I welcome you to reach out to someone you know or someone you don't know in the course of the event. Um, you can use the participant list, which is in the virtual exchange exhibition space. Um, the password um, will get you into a list of the participants and if they have shared a social media contact with us, um, or if you happen to know them, reach out to them by messaging app, WhatsApp, Signal, Twitter, whatever you use to communicate. Just say, hey, great to be here together. If you want to actually communicate with everyone or if you want to stay in the platform we're using you can also use the chat if you don't know zoom there's a button somewhere down there for you um, that will open up the chat window and you can send a message to everyone or you can send a message to individuals um, in fact i would encourage you all just to say hello let us know you're there let us know where you are how's the weather just just let us know you're there connect um, and if you don't know anyone there's a number of people on the, the, the programming committee for this event that I would highly encourage you to reach out to. If you're a Twitter person, our communications and outreach officer, Eliza Papaki, will be on Twitter. Uh, she is at DariaEU. Our hashtag today is DariaVX, and you can find her there. Otherwise, if you just have a question or if you just want to feel like you're sitting next to somebody, kind of ask the person next to you, you know, whether they liked the biscuits at coffee, um, it's okay. You can ask that kind of question. Um, the people I'd highly recommend are the rest of the program committee. Uh, Michelle Doran, Vicky Garnett, and Nicole Basaraba are all on the chat. Reach out to them. They can say hi to you now. Um, and by all means, make a connection there. You will hear more from them later in the breakout sessions. And then finally, um, I just want to introduce the last person on our program committee, Erzbet Tostifra. She is there working as our uh, chief technical officer today. So if you have any particular technical problems, she may be the one you want to reach out to. Um, and the one thing I would remind you is, yes, I know we're all sitting in these atomized spaces talking to machines, but be kind, be generous, be empathetic. Um, this is a, a very, very human event, and we want to make sure that it stays there. So. But why, why, why have this crazy event on a, on a Thursday afternoon? Well, there was a moment in March um, when, and I know you all had equivalents of this moment in your own lives, where we as an organization, the Daria Eric, we had to cancel our annual community event. These events get about 300 people. So it's actually quite, um, it's a big deal for us. And so just like everyone else, we had to say that the event that would have had us all in Zagreb at this very moment, was not going to happen until November. And then the interesting thing at the same time was just as we sort of felt, okay, now we have to do what everyone else is doing, suddenly everyone else was doing what we do all the time because as a distributed virtual research infrastructure, we spend a lot of time in virtual spaces working together. And so suddenly everyone was doing what Daria does all the time. But it wasn't all going so well. And I, I put a quote, this is a, an actual quote from an email I received about an, a webinar that was an unmitigated disaster, according to the host, um, with people eating breakfast, making phone calls, noisy children, and 
literally they, they pulled the plug on the webinar partway through and that was at the end of March. And I just felt this is a time of, of the virtual encounter. We've kind of figured out what to do with certain technologies, but it all of a sudden felt that we assume, we make assumptions about the virtual meeting, that it will do the same kinds of things that the face-to-face -face meeting will. Not all of us, obviously many people are very thoughtful about this, but generally there's a kind of a sense of not knowing how to find the difference that makes a difference when we go from the face-to-face -to, -face to the virtual. And of course, there is great literature out there about the coming time when we will use the virtual better because obviously it's not just COVID-19 that gets us to think about um, changing the way we travel, changing the way that we interact. Um, but suddenly we were in the middle of a piece of practice-based research that none of us expected. So how could we use the virtual to really meet our needs? And one of the things that occurred to us is that, well, the Daria annual event was in planned to be on the topic of scholarly primitives. It's 20 years since John Unsworth wrote the original seminal piece of research on scholarly primitives. And we thought that would be a great thing to revisit now in the light of two decades of, of research and work and extensions, but also of experience of the change in research habits among humanists. And we thought, well, can we look at scholarly meetings through the lens of scholarly primitives? Can we actually draw out a set of primitives that might help us understand these better? And so suddenly we felt that this experience that all the world seemed to be going through um, was not just a digital humanities topic, but one that we had in some way been preparing ourselves to take on. So we pulled out lots of different versions of primitives. And it's interesting that in the program committee, which has been an absolute joy to work with, um, thank you all very much. If I haven't said it enough, I want to say it publicly. Um, we talked a lot about the, um, the primitive sets that we held to us, both the original set that, that were cross-cutting primitives came up. And then we also looked at, well, if this is a, a, a set of um, terms that we can use to understand research processes. Well, if that's kind of more the solitary side of what we do, if that's the, the thing that drives our thinking and our research when we're sort of digging into problems and digging into sources, maybe we need to look elsewhere. So we looked at some of the things like the commonly named uh, purposes of scholarly publishing, registration, dissemination, certification, and archiving. And then we also looked at some of the work that was coming out. Um, and I, I have Jeffrey Walker looking straight at me here. He can't tell that, but I can. Um, where other sets of, of potential uh, functions uh, for scholarly meetings were proposed, such as social presence, cognitive presence, access to leadership presence, and negotiation of research agenda. But we still felt that if what we were looking for is something actionable, something we could use to say, either this is a meeting that has to be face-to-face -face because of X, or this is a function of this meeting that we want to do differently because we need X, something a little different. So we kind of started digging into the idea of the primitives a little bit more. And we looked specifically at, well, what happens at a scholarly meeting? What happens at a conference? And we started categorizing things. We came up with these four categories. We did boil them down into specific terms. Um, th there just wasn't enough time. Um, and we do hope to come back to this afterwards, after your, your feedback and after this event. But we felt that there was this aspect of the knowledge sharing, verification, certification, and that that was important. We also felt looking at things like poster sessions and networking events and the hallway chats. We're really captured by the hallway chats because it's this moment in between the formal and the, the informal. You're just releasing the, the, the listening and the feedback and the presenting loop and you're moving towards something more open where you have these semi-structured, serendipitous individual or small group interactions. And we looked at things, the idea of sort of social listening of all listening together, of being in that space, being together, breathing the same smell of coffee, breathing the same overcooled air. Um, there's a sociality to listening that we sometimes forget or lose or don't feel the same way in a virtual space. Um, and of course, the things like name badges and buffet dinners and, and letting our hair down with our professional peers. Um, the whole idea that there are shared experiences for community identity building. And then finally, there was a real aspect that there is collaborative work. There is work and learning that goes on between peers that is not perhaps, you know, from top to bottom or bottom to top, but side to side. Um, and 
in discussing this, however, we kept singing, finding things we said, well, that isn't really a permanent. We can't say that, that that's a function, but it's something that happens. The semi-formality or the informality of a lot of the interactions was part of this. The openness, the disruption. Um, the fact that you're embedded in a particular space, a particular physical experience, this whole idea learning is embodied, it's situated, and that has something to do with how we absorb information. Um, the empathy and the trust building uh, that happens in a physical space. Um, the fact that we are physically and culturally displaced, which removes some cult comforts and constraints. You know, you can't get the tea bag that you're used to. You don't have your children around. But, you know, so it removes those, but it actually it adds constraints as well, because then you have to adapt quickly to something that might be new. Um, the openness to serendipity, uh, whether you see it as an inspiration or just something that kind of is a mental palate cleanser, I think those might be really in some ways the same thing. Um, the personal and social responsibilities we feel when we invest in traveling to a space, when we invest in being in a room with people. And of course, we also kept coming back to the importance of these kinds of events for early career research. It's, it's a chance to be recognized, a chance to learn, a chance to connect. We can and run things in a virtual space better than we can put things from the foundation up. So we looked at those. And then we asked you all, when you registered for this event, to give us some more information about how you saw these kinds of interactions. So this is very much a crowdsourced version, a crowdsourced enhancement of what we originally came up with. And what became very clear in going through the responses about what do you think the scholarly primitives are? Why do you go to meetings? First and foremost, the idea of formal publication always sort of lurked off to the side because there were many, many references to presenting, getting feedback, listening to learning. So there was a sense that what we were seeing is this kind of informal um, echo, this informal version of the formal publication cycle. And I thought it was very interesting. If you think about the history of scholarly publication, it goes back to a time when we were trying to make the ephemeral into the concrete. Um, but of course, now I think it's almost the ephemeral that we need to hold on to and preserve as ephemeral, not necessarily as something we want to um, fasten down into a fixed referenceable source. And then there was a third echo. And every one of the, you know, we have the, the idea of the publication cycle being echoed in the conference presentation, in the, the engagement with our, our, our peers. But then there was this idea that there was this yet finer echo of discussion and information formal exchange and experiencing things. And it was quite interesting to see how the, the, the representation of these various cycles were very similar and mapped onto each other, but had these ever increasing amounts of informality. And then we saw a sort of a shift where it went from ideas to people. So it went from engaging with ideas, finding out about ideas, sharing ideas, to actually building durable links with people, building networks, building projects, building and maintaining communities. Each one of these at a slightly further distance from the actual work of the conference, but very, very important. And what was interesting as well, we asked people to say, is this better served by the virtual, better served by the um, physical, or, or can it be equally well served by both? And uh, as you move from the left to the right, there was a clear sense that these um, human connections were much harder to build in virtual space. Again, I think we can build on, but it's hard to build from the ground up. But there was something more, and this is what I found particularly interesting because we also asked you in the spirit of having some kind of, um, of real sort of human interaction, we asked you to share your anecdotes about conferences, about scholarly meetings, about interactions. And what we found there was a very different tone and a very different emphasis. And I've just taken out some key terms, key, key uh, phrases from those. Um, there were some negative. Um, in fact, there was one or two people who, who felt that their experiences of conferences, what they remembered was feelings of exclusion, feeling of hierarchies, feeling of, of um, not being able to connect. So not every response was like this, but the vast majority came through with these very strong positive terms about passion and creativity and liberation, and risk taking, and discovery, and uh, you know, conversations lasting through the night, the durability of impact, the feeling of community, the sharing, being delighted, being supported, feeling, seeing friends for warmth. There was this incredible positivity in that corpus. 
And what I found most interesting was not only was it so human and warm, um, but phrases like it changed my attitude, it changed my life. So somewhere beyond those communities that we build, we also build ourselves, we build identities. And I think it's important to recognize that and remember that. I think we nod towards it and we know that this happens. But if this is a key thing that we're doing in these meetings, then it's important to make sure we make space to preserve it where we move to virtual spaces. <coughs> and there is a question as to whether this can happen as effectively or even whether it can happen at all in online spaces. Um, and we talked a lot about examples and people and of of course, you know, not everyone can be Lev Manovich and not everyone can find a kind of a liberation and a joy and a support in teaching via Zoom. But it's interesting, the, the, the ideas and the strengths that he indicates in this quote that we took from his, his Facebook page. Um, we can be comfortable, we can think better. Um, we can, I can show my screen so people can see it well in their laptops rather than trying to, to, to make out a single room screen far away. So again, it's a, it's a, a nod to physical limitations. It's an equalizer. Um, and he really felt that there was incredible strength in this. And we felt it was important to, to, to recognize that. And of course, the, the teacher-student teacher relationship has been one that's been particularly disrupted in this time. Um, and we are looking more at relationships between scholars, but in some ways, um, that kind of mentoring relationship is also something which really does suffer from this lack of, of the human connection. So it's something that we, we felt is on a continuum with what we're talking about. But we didn't want to go into it too deeply because there is a huge amount of, um, of discussion and um, a certain amount of discontent and worry about this now. But we can't ignore the fact that there is also a strong body of research that leads us towards um, understanding presence. Um, and I, there's a couple of things that I ended up looking at and thinking, yes, okay, this sort of encapsulates for me exactly why we need to define what we risk losing if we move more and more online as scholars and, and have our meetings more and more online, and therefore what we need to fight to pre preserve and find good ways to preserve. Um, and Sherry Turkle's On Conversation, many of you may know it, it's not, a, it's not a new book, but the idea that, because conversation was a word that came up again and again in the responses, the idea that conversations are a little bit dangerous because we can't control everything that's going to happen. We have to respond in real time. And sometimes we're a bit realer than we mean to be. Um, but without conversation, we are less empathetic, we're less connected, we're less creative, and we're less fulfilled. We are diminished in retreat. Um, and this is where we don't want to be. But on a slightly more positive side, and I'm, I'm very grateful, you will, you will later meet uh, Courtney Grile, who introduced me to this uh, article only just today. Um, the idea that shared emotion and atmosphere are connected. And I love these two ideas um, because it is in some ways through emotion that we, we really mark memories, that we learn, that we are able to create some of these things. Um, and, you know, we can, we can be as professional as we want to, and yet we are still emotional beings. Um, and the idea that mutual self-other awareness is requiring this kind of sense that two or more individuals are mutually aware that each other are experiencing emotion of the same type, complete with overlapping thematic and effective content. The indeterminate nature of an atmosphere as something that is both subject-like and object-like means that it can function as a common ground between individuals. So in some ways, it's the creation of this atmosphere um, that we somehow want to find a way to rehabilitate, to preserve, to maintain in the virtual space. And that may be one of the key things that we are potentially losing. Mm -hmm.